good to have all of you here tonight for student night. Uh, some of you probably know we do this, try to do this once a semester. Uh, we appreciate all of you that's made it out tonight. And uh, appreciate Travis uh, playing the piano for us. Yes. And, uh, appreciate that very much. We talked some about it, and uh, we finally got a piano here, so we appreciate that, Travis. And uh, but our speaker tonight, uh, some of you already know him. Maybe there might be a few here that haven't met Bob. That is uh, Bob Bowman, and Bob lives in Paintsville or Pikeville? Paintsville. Paintsville, Kentucky. And he is like semi-retired or something. Uh, but he's been with uh, New Tribes Mission uh, for many, many years. And he has literally been all over the world. He was on the field for many years and uh, has had a lot of experiences. He was here last year with us several times, and he's already been here in September. So we've asked him to come back tonight for student night and uh, share the word with us or whatever the Lord has given to him. So, Brother Bob. It's kind of dramatic getting up here again this, this time on a Tuesday night about 6 o'clock. I was sitting starting to watch the news and I thought, oh man, I was supposed to be up at Tri-State Bible College tonight. So I said, my wife said, you were. I said, yeah, I was. I think. She said, well, go look at the calendar. So I went and looked at the calendar. I said, I'll look at my palm. So I looked at my palm. Guys that I know. So I looked at my palm. And, uh, and uh, it wasn't on there. So then I scrambled around. I got John's phone number. I John, this is Bob. So I was supposed to be up there tonight. And you know what he answered? Well, yeah, Bob. We know where she's going. That guy he is. So it's going to come a little traumatic real for me. I got it on the calendar after we yeah, talked about it for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a privilege always to share the word. I thought I'd bring something that came to you tonight that came to my email yesterday. Now I want to uh, I want to speak to you too because I know some of you are pastors, some of you will be pastors, and uh, some of the things that I have to say tonight I think uh, will speak to that situation. Interesting, you're going to have a little seminar on young people why they don't stay in the church and that, that sort of thing. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit tonight. And uh, not on that specifically, but I think it applies to our young people as well as to our other folks. But what came to me yesterday was this, and uh, you may want to take this to heart. Ten heresy hiders in evangelicalism. Okay? Starts out this way. If you want to penetrate evangelicalism with heresy, here are ten things you can do. Okay? Put your heresy in a song with a great beat. It will be sung in churches all over the world. Put your heresy in a song with some sentimentality. Many evangelicals like to sing about mommies, babies, daddies, and the glory of heaven. <clears throat> Appeal to the sinful nature. I want to hear how awesome I am, so tell me how awesome I am. Appeal to the idolatry of your hearers. If you live in an entertainment-centered society, make sure you entertain while presenting your heresy. If you live in a postmodern society, make sure you say nothing absolute while appealing to the only truth you know. I'm not sure. <laughs> Dress it up in new clothes. Don't present heresy as the previous heresy was presented. Instead, dress up in new clothes. Present the heresy like a politician does. Use catchphrases that sound biblical. Most people will walk away thinking, saying, and believing your catchphrases. Change definitions. If you change the definitions of words, you can sign any document or agree with any orthodox doctrine. You know what you mean. Just make sure no one else does. Try to please everyone a little bit, for after all, when it comes to doctrine and evangelicalism, you don't have to be orthodox. You just need to sound orthodox. Appear cool, sweet, metro, or simply different from other pastors. 
spike your hair. I wish I could. <laughs> spike your hair and dress cool. Say curse words from the pulpit occasionally. Be edgy, a type of shock jock. Be the Howard Stern of the evangelical world. Get everyone to like your personality. If everyone likes you, then you can say almost anything. Always be positive and encouraging. Grow the crowd numerically. If your methods produce visible numbers, then you can say almost anything. In evangelicalism, numbers equal success. And success, not biblical obedience, is the goal. Increase giving and baptisms. If you're bringing in money in numbers, you can bud, do, or say anything. Make sure the world thinks you're a big deal. If the world likes you, the evangelical church may love you as well. Well, I wouldn't really take that with you to your church, but uh, you get the picture. And uh, we're afflicted with that in our culture these days. I want to start out tonight, uh, first of all, I want to ask the Lord to make sure that He is in what we say, so let's pray before we come to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we're deeply grateful for Your Word. We come to you tonight and we understand that we are not worthy of the salvation that you have provided in Christ. We're not worthy to open your word and have you reveal yourself to us through it and in it. Nevertheless, we ask tonight, because of Christ and because he is eminently worthy, we ask tonight that as we come to your word that you would meet us in the word. We pray that we would see you. We pray that we would give attention to to our own lives, and particularly to the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in His name that we pray tonight. Amen. Now we go to Philippians chapter 2. And I just want to I want to start there. I and I use this just as as a as one of many innumerable passages. That could, have, that could be used to illustrate what I want to talk about tonight. <clears throat> what I want to talk about to you tonight is uh, some of you pastors, some of you will be pastors, is that you uh, do not provoke the flesh of your people. And I think that applies to this young people and why they don't stay in the church and so on. And uh, I think it's because lots of people sitting in our pews are deeply, deeply frustrated with trying to be good, whatever that is, Christians. And for a lot of young people, they see people trying to be good Christians that uh, don't seem to be making it, or at least they're talking like they are, but the kids know better. And that's one reason they don't stick around. And another reason they don't stick around is because they find it very, very difficult to live up to whatever that good Christian may look like. And so I'm going to talk about that a bit tonight. And the matter of grace, grace. Well, it's in Philippians chapter 2. Paul, of course, is uh, in prison and he's writ written back to the Philippians or up to the Philippians <coughs> in grace. And so he is... Uh, encourages them. Let me go back over up to uh, 127. I'll start there. Let your life, manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. <clears throat> For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by, now watch it, some of these things. By being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, 
taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every <clears throat> knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if the Apostle Paul had stopped there, he would have run the risk, he would have run the risk of provoking the flesh of the Philippians, his hearers. Fortunately, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he does not stop there. But I want to stop there a minute and just talk about why that would be true. Listen, if, if you were in church on Sunday and your pastor said, Listen, church, you need to be of the same mind. You need to have the same love. You need to be in full accord and of one mind with each other. Nothing in this church from rivalry or conceit. Others more significant than yourselves. Looking also to the interests of others. In other words, if you are exhorted to do these things, to do these things, to do these things, and you leave it at the end of the exhortation, the question automatically is whether it can be articulated or not by many people, including some of those young people that you'll talk about. <clears throat> whether it can be articulated or not is this. So how am I going to do that? Okay. <clears throat> How am I going to love? How am I going to have one mind? Look at these people. You know, it's difficult to soar like an eagle when you go to church with turkeys. <laughs> How am I supposed to be of one accord with these people? And so on. And so, Pastor, if you just leave it at an exhortation for them to behave themselves, in effect, to be more Christ-like, those, those are all kinds of words that we use. You need to be Christ-like. We're going to work on being Christ-like. And you leave it there and don't talk about how that happens equally, equally to balance out what's going on here. You will run the risk of provoking their flesh. Now the next verse is where Paul gives the solution. It is God who works in you. Both to will, I like the old English, and to do his good pleasure. Augustine famously prayed this <clears throat> to the Lord. Give what you command. This is the Lord. Give what you command. <clears throat> then command what you will. And the idea is that if it does not come from the Lord first, it's not likely to come from us mm. by our self-determination by our dedication, by our will, and all of that. Now, you say, well, I, I willed to do some things for the Lord when I really didn't want to do it, but the fact is you willed to do it. Mm -hmm. And the Scriptures say that the will to do God's will comes from Him. Mm -hmm. It's called grace. What you have here in verse 13 is a little definition of grace. I understand our stock definition of grace. It's not a very favor, and that's what brings us to salvation. But here's a practical definition. God is working in, in you to will and to do His good pleasure. Now, when you, well, we came to Christ. Justification. Good, I'm in a Bible school. You know, you would go to some churches and you preach and you say, justification, and they go... I even had a pastor say once, when you said justification... I knew you lost them. Mm. Mm. I wanted to say, but I was cool. I wanted to say, and what have you been doing for the last four or five years, Pastor? <laughs> you know, but anyway, when we talk about justification, when a sinner first comes to Christ, without getting into the ins and outs of, uh, <clears throat> of free will theism and uh, determinism and all of that sort of thing, I think everybody, except perhaps Charles Finney, is agreed that unless 
the whole the Trinity is involved in a sinner coming to Christ, he's not coming to Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus said, if the Father draws him, you know, the Father will draw those that come to me. When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convince of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay? And then I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to Myself. The whole Trinity is involved in a sinner coming to be justified for the first time. It is very much a situation where it is God at work in that sinner to will him to come and to do His good pleasure. Okay? And God's good pleasure is that that person should be saved. And so you can see that's a definition of grace. Now here's where we drop the ball often. And this has been on my heart, actually, since I dealt with kids. You know, my history, besides the Bolivian and all that stuff, is that I was I taught chemistry and physics in a public high school. I was chairman of the science department. <coughs> Many, many years ago, okay? Before I was 30, all right? Well, no, not exactly, but around a long time, okay? And uh, the Lord dragged me kicking and screaming into the ministry through a gang of kids, and I ended up leaving the public school and becoming youth pastor to two or three hundred kids. And I, and I noticed exactly what you're going to talk about in your seminar. And that is that some of them stayed and some of them left. And of course, some of them were in church because they had to be, after all, mom and dad and all that stuff. And uh, <clears throat> But they were very, very frustrated with the whole business of walking with the Lord. What Paul calls their walk. In Ephesians, he talks about it. Here, he talks about it. Walk worthy, walk worthy. That's a good Pauline expression. And so they were very concerned. They could be very concerned about coming to Christ to be justified. But then we drop the ball when we give the impression that your, here's another word, it's a Bible college though, so it doesn't matter, right? Your <laughs> sanctification is by grace alone, just as your justification, just as my justification, just as all of our sanctifications and justification, it's by grace alone. <clears throat> but when we give the impression, you Christians better get with the program. We invite people to we invite people to try to do it in what Paul might term in the flesh. Okay? And if you try to do the if you try to be a Christian in the flesh, it is going to be one frustrating experience. Mm-hmm. And so we need to be careful that when we are preaching, and this is one thing that recommends expository preaching, particularly if you're preaching Paul. The Apostle Paul talks about Christian conduct a lot. But he equally talks about our position in Christ and who we are in Christ and what Christ has done and how it's all about Christ and it is God that works in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. And if God doesn't give you the will to, there's not going to be any due to. Okay? And so, <clears throat> when we just exhort people and invite them to, by their self-determination, do what they're going to do for the Lord, they wear out on that very quickly. We see that on the mission field. We see people that go off to the mission field because some guy like me came to their church and preached this sermon. If the Lord hasn't called you to stay, why aren't you gone? You know, that kind of thing. Big guilt trip comes over the congregation. And then some people say, well, I better go to the mission field. And off they go to the mission field. Guilty as can be. Guess what? They don't stay. Mm-hmm. Others look at the mission field and they hear some guy like me say in their church, you know, there are 2,500, maybe 3,000 tribes that have not one word of the Gospel. Okay, I walk into a Bible bookstore. What do I see in the Bible bookstore? I see, well, 43 versions of the English Bible, you know, the cheerleaders Bible, the football players Bible, oh, no. the, the Cook's Bible, the this Bible, the that Bible, and all the and it's three thousand tribes that haven't got one word of any Bible in their language. So when I say stuff like that, and it's true, when I say stuff like that, 
you are invited to say, I'm gritting my teeth and going to the mission field. Mm -hmm. And when you grit your teeth and go to the mission field, you will discover when you get there that you will, you, you will not want to stay. You will not want to stay big time. In fact, you won't. All right? Probably. The other thing is you look at the need. Oh, my, these needy people. Millions, billions of people that need the gospel. I will go and meet the need. Well, guess what? When you get there, wherever it is you're going to meet the need, you're going to discover needs that are just massive. And you're going to feel like the little Dutch kid with his thumb in the dike. And you're just hanging on with your thumb hanging in there. And somehow or other you're trying to meet those needs. And you can't meet those needs. And what's the problem? The problem is that all of that kind of thing comes out of our self-determination, our self-dedication, our grit, our whatever, okay? If you're going to the mission field, we want to be sure that God has worked in your heart to will you to the field, and when you get there, to do what needs to be done on the field. But guess what? If God wants your life to change, if you want your life to change, if God wants your life to change, we want to be sure that God is at work in you both to will the change in behavior and to give you the ability to do it. Because if you find, if you come to the place where you say, well, I finally got over, and name the sin, you know, thousands of them, I finally got over that, and that's where it is. I finally got over that. It's only going to be a source of pride. It's not a, it's not a product of grace. And so I think there are a lot of folks sitting in our views that are really, really frustrated with being unable to live up to the behavioral standards of the New Testament without understanding that those are the product of something. They are not the cause of anything. One of the places where we really get into this is the matter of personal devotions. There are all kinds of programs. Going to read the Bible in a year. No, no Bible, no breakfast. You know that one? Okay, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I can do that for about three days. For about three days. We've all been through that. Okay, and by the way, that personal devotions thing, that fight goes on until the funeral. Mm -hmm. And it is perhaps the biggest one. And so you've started the program 852 times, and you haven't followed through on it, or it's some sin that besets you, and so on. And so the more you grit your teeth to get over it, or to do it, whatever it is, the, le the less successful it seems to be. And the problem is, we are looking for that you know, Bible, no breakfast program, read the Bible in a year program. Nothing wrong with those things, okay? Those kinds of programs, to produce the spirituality, which is going to cause us to think, that we really are doing a number spiritually. And at that point, it becomes a point of pride, not a matter of grace of God. Our mm -hmm. sanctification is by grace as well as our justification. Well, the experience, of course, of doing it in the flesh is recounted over in Romans uh, chapter 7. <clears throat> this is a familiar passage. I'm sure that you're familiar with this. If, you, if you're not familiar with this by passage, you certainly are familiar with this by experience. At uh, Romans 7.15, I'm going to skip some of this for time's sake. I do not understand my own actions. Oh, we say, I, I never read that passage before, but I'll bet you've been through I don't understand my own actions before, haven't you? Indeed. And so have the folks sitting in the pew in the church that you minister to or will minister to. They understand that big time. And when the, the devotions program comes up, when the how come you're not here every time the church doors are open, things comes up, all those things, they say, man, I ought to do those things. I want to do those things. I'm going to do those things. And then they don't do those things, and they end up right here. I don't understand my own actions. I really want to do those things, but I'm not doing those things. Hmm. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Oh, man, it gets worse. 
It's worse than the beginning. I do what I hate to do. And when you provoke the flesh, when you provoke that old man to do it in his self-determination, you get into some very, very difficult things. I end up doing what I hate to do. And then I say, I don't understand my own actions. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I read this verse in a Sunday school class once, far from here, so it's a place. And I can see one guy in the back getting a little uneasy. Paul said, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And then I read on. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. We can talk about flesh for a minute, I guess. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability. There it is. It's God who is at work in you to will and to do Amen. His good pleasure. But I don't have the ability to carry it out. That is the experience that we've all experienced, and it's the experience of the people in our churches. And we need to give them hope that the, that the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train. But that God will work in us to will and to do His good pleasure. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, what if He doesn't? Okay. How would it be possible for the Creator of the universe... <coughs> the Savior of the world in the person of the Holy Spirit dwelling in my body, how would it be impossible for Him not to will and to work His good pleasure? Now what we often mean when we say what if He doesn't is He's not doing it fast enough. Okay? You know what? He's doing it just as fast as it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, it, so that it in fact works out. You know what? Folks in our churches need to hear, you know the guy that uh, has come from an alcoholic background and he, keep, and he finds himself wandering into the bar nevertheless on Saturday night and then he shows up in church on Sunday morning and he hates it. And he hates himself. For all of that guy needs to hear. God is at work in you both to will and to do His good pleasure, and you're going to get over this in His time. In His time. <clears throat> in fact, let me tell you this little story, and if I've told it already, you're just indulging me. You old guy here is indulging me. I was a pastor of a church in Massachusetts, and... Uh, And we were a young church, and we were meeting at that time in a school. And uh, all of a sudden, people started coming off the street. And I wish I could say to you, I sat in my study. I didn't have a study, okay? I, I sat one day, and, and I, I just thought, this great plan. This great plan for evangelism. It's the Bob plan for evangelism. <laughs> I, we're going to do these 13 things and people are going to come pouring in here and fall down on their knees and faces and trust Christ. Sorry to tell you, it didn't work that way. Okay? I just kept preaching the Word and suddenly they started coming. I can remember the day that those people from off the street began to come. This little girl came in, sat down in the front row, right in front of where I was standing speaking, and she had a black eye that looked like that. And I thought, man, I didn't know her. I thought, man, alive, what in the, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa what, what's this all about? Afterward, I learned, of course, that you know where she got the black eye from the husband that she lived with. Well, <clears throat> she came back the next week, came back the next week, kept wailing away on the Word. I was preaching through the Gospel of John at that time. Next thing I know, here she comes with some others with her. And they are they are concerned about the Word of God. Okay? And they start coming to Christ. These people, and some of them really rough around the edges. 
One of the couples that came to Christ were very influential in town. I don't know if you're familiar with New England, but in New England it's not about the county, it's about the town. Okay? I mean, there is a Worcester County, Massachusetts, and it's the whole center of Massachusetts, but nobody gives much attention to that. It's what town you live in. You live in West Boylston or Princeton or Rutland or any of those places. Are you a townie? That's what it's about in New England. The couple that came, this guy was a selectman. That's the equivalent of a county supervisor. He was a selectman in the town. His wife was on the school board. <clears throat> they first came to find out what the problem was with us, that we would not join in the various ecumenical things if they wanted to do it. Like they had a, a uh, deal where all the pastors in town kind of shuffled pulpits once a year. And so, they, they wanted me to go preach in the Catholic Church, and they wanted the Catholic priest to come and preach at Bethlehem Baptist Church, and I, we just not going to do that. I told them, I'd be glad to come and preach in the Catholic Church, but so I got to work the other way. Well, that's pretty, like that, in a small town in New England, and so what's the deal? This lady's on the school board, her husband's a selectman. And so on. So they come in. They just want to see what the deal is. And I'm preaching, and uh, in through God, through the Gospel of John. Turns out she plays the organ in the Congregational Church across the street. And I don't know if you know about New England Congregationalism, but they they left long ago. They left the word. It's about all kinds of other things. Okay. And so okay, that's fine. Next thing I know, she comes. She comes into the service about uh, half, you know, just as I'm about getting ready to start preaching. And then, and then she's out, and then the next Sunday she comes in, and that goes on for a while. And I, you know, what I came to find out was she was going over to the congregational church playing the organ for the thing, and then sneaking out of there and coming across the street to Bethlehem Baptist Church to hear the Word, Amen. of all things. <laughs> Anyway, she and her husband come to Christ. I don't want to make a long story longer. And I'll tell you what, they were they were serious smokers. <laughs> serious smokers. Not dilettante smokers. Serious smokers. Okay. And so were a lot of these other people who were coming off the street. So one morning I get to church, and I am greeted by the elders. <coughs> Need to have a little meeting. Okay. So here's, you, you, now you know what this meeting was about, don't you? It started out like this. Now, Pastor Bob, we really like having all these baby Christians here. Next word? Uh, but, but <laughs> <laughs> here was the deal. But, they're lighting up in front out here. What are people going to think? I said, well, they're going to think, they're lighting up in front of that out here. That's what they're going to think, I guess. I said, you know what? I don't think we ought to. I don't think we ought to say to them, "Okay, it's great you've come to Christ. Now we're going to tell you how you're going to behave." All right? I don't think we ought to do that. Okay? Yeah, we kind of see where you're going with that. How about if we have them go around and back? I said, that'll be good. We're glad you've come to Christ until you learn how to behave. Could you please go and back <laughs> so nobody could see you? That'll be good. Yeah, well, no, that wouldn't be so good either. So how about we just forget it and we'll ask the Lord to do whatever it is He's going to do with these people. Understand now, they might keep smoking and that's going to irritate you guys. Some of you. All right. But let's just see what happens. Well, every every Sunday in that little church, well, it was a bigger church by that time, but anyway, every Sunday in church, we had a time when people could just go up and give their testimony on Sunday morning. And there was a lot of those because we have these people coming off the street at this point in time. And so a week went on. And then in the next week, time for time to share. Okay. This lady and her husband get up. And she says, because she was kind of the spokesman there. <laughs> she says, she says, you know, the Lord has just been working on his mom and I about this smoking. And we just think, 
we just think he wants us to stop. And we're going to be really ugly for the next three or four months. <laughs> okay? And so, could you just pray for us and understand? If it's gonna, and I'm up there just going, yes, preach it, sister. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. That's exactly how it is supposed to be. Now you say, well, what if, you know, what if they hadn't stopped smoking? Well, guess what? They'd still be smoking. And I guess that's what would happen. When the Lord wants to put the brakes on that, the Lord will put the brakes on that. Yes. Amen. When if I start railing about it from the pulpit, all I do is invite them to grit their teeth and try to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. You get it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that and that's in all kinds of areas that we address as Christians, and in all kinds of things that we read, in in uh, things like we read over in Philippians, and things like we read in the various lists of prohibitions that are given in the New Testament, all those kind of fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, all those things ending in self-control. Come on now, church. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, ending in self-control. You people love each other. I see there's some of you that can't even share in the donut and coffee time together because you can't stand each other. Now you've got to get with it. So they grit their teeth and go, okay, I'm going to love them. I am going to love these turkeys that I go to church with. Okay, and guess what? They hate them worse. They hate them worse than they did before. But if the Lord makes the moves, they're going to get some victory, and He's going to get the glory. And that's what it's all about. And we want to be sure that in our preaching, that not only do we talk about those behavior kinds of things, but that we also talk about the power that produces those kinds of things. Now let's finish this deal up. And John said to me, we have till 8 o'clock if it takes that long. John, <laughs> it will. Okay. I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. I have the desire to do what's right. I don't have the ability. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now I come to verse 20, and I remember I told you about the guy that was getting edgy in Sunday school. At verse 20 I read, Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it. And that I there is an intensified form of I, to the verb to be. <clears throat> okay, I who do it but sin that dwells within me. I read that. Finally the guy gets up and he says, I don't think I like what I'm hearing here. <laughs> you know what? I said, I love what I'm hearing here. What I'm hearing here is the Apostle Paul saying there is a real me now that I'm in Christ. And the real me loves to do what God wants me to do. I don't have the ability to carry it out because my flesh is strong. Amen. But that's not me. That's the old me. There's a new me that desires to do what God wants him to do. I said, you know, I said, God, I love what I'm hearing there because that's me. That's me, man. Okay? And if I can look at the thing, at the way I am and the things that I do and all of those things which, I, which we just have to candidly say, don't please the Lord, it's so precious to be able to look at a passage like that and say, because Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit here, to look at a passage like that and say, you see how God makes the separation in what He sees? There's the old me that is subject to the flesh, and there's the new me that wants to carry out what He wants to do, and that's who He sees because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's who He sees. So I find it to be a law. And when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. Ah, in my mind, I want to please God. We've all had that experience. There have been times, there have been times when you have sinned and I have sinned, and even before it happens, we're saying, I don't, I don't want to get involved in this. And let's be candid, there have been times when we have planned sin. <laughs> okay, let's just face it. We have planned sin. And in our mind, 
This isn't right. This isn't good. We go ahead. But it's not right. It's not good. In my mind, in my inner being, I delight in the law of God. The fact that we have this concept is evidence that we belong to Christ. Amen. Pagans sin with impunity. No problem. There's nothing more miserable than a sinning Christian. I won't ask anybody to raise their hands, okay? <laughs> All right? There's nothing more miserable than a sinning Christian. Why? Because we have this thing in my mind and in my inner being. I delight in the law of God, but I find evil close at hand, and I fall into it. And it tears me up. The tearing up is evidence of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it ought to cause us to weep for the sin and weep with joy for the Savior mm -hmm. that has produced that. <clears throat> Makes me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, his other law. Wretched man that I am. I think we all know about that. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that I myself, there's that intensifying for me, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. If you leave it there, they walk out, gritting their teeth, determined that they are not going to serve the law of sin again this week, and they won't make it through Burger King. Mm -hmm. Before they do, and they'll be back at, I don't understand my actions. And if they're young people, and they keep going through this conflict, they may see, you know what? I'm just trashing the whole thing. I can't do this. Paul doesn't leave it there. Chapter 8 is not a good chapter division, in my opinion. Because here's the bottom line. Bottom line is this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. I know the King James says, who walk not after the who walk at, at, not after the flesh but after the spirit and I think uh, the commentary is correct it says that's a copy from verse 4 no doubt okay because the statement is flat out there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death doesn't mean there is no law of sin and death but we've been set free from it for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not as sinful flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Now verse 4 is precious. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh. And you know what our people need to hear on Sunday morning? On those times, and there are times when they need to be confronted. There are times when they need to be challenged. There are times when they need to be chewed out. But what they need to hear at the end is exactly what's heard at the end of all of this that Paul is writing. The righteous requirements of the law have been fulfilled in us in Jesus Christ. That's what they need to walk out on. Let's talk about the righteous requirements of the law for a minute. Well, one of the righteous requirements of the law is this, is it not? Let's just take the Ten Commandments as a, and call it a summary, you know, God's moral law. If you keep all Ten Commandments, what? What's the result? You're righteous. You're righteous and you will live. And you will live. You keep all ten, you will live. Okay, well, that's trouble. Right? Because we haven't kept, nobody can keep all ten. You know, Moses went to get the ten. People of Israel were down below breaking every one of them before he ever got down the mountain. <clears throat> so we can't do that. But there is another righteous requirement of the law that goes the other way, isn't there? And it is, if you break even one of these, you... You know, you die. You die. You've broken them all and you die. 
My Bible says that the righteous requirement of the law has been met in us, in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay? Why? He came, he kept the law. I'm in him. Righteous requirement of the law met. He came, he died a death he did not deserve. Righteous requirement of the law met in him. I am in Christ. God sees me in Christ. Thank God. Thank His dear name that He doesn't see me in me, but He sees me in Christ. That little prepositional phrase is used repeatedly by Paul. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. It is a precious phrase, and it is a meaningful phrase. For all that we are, and all that we do, revolves around the fact that we are in Christ. Well, I don't have time to talk tonight about, well, so how do we proceed? I'll, I'll give you this, and some other night we'll talk about this. How many of you know who John Gill is? Was. Well, he is. Glory of the Jesus. John Gill is the preacher that preceded Spurgeon and Metropolitan Tabernacle. One of the last of Spurgeon is called the last Puritan. John Gill is more puritanical than Charles Adams Spurgeon. But John Gill wrote one of, in my opinion, wrote one of the best, most comprehensive verse-by-verse -verse commentaries on the Bible that has ever been written, bar none. You know, I know every year we come out with the commentary of what's happening now, and all of that. That's fine, and it's good. Okay, but if you want, if you, if you, you know, you go to some commentaries, you get some of those difficult verses, and you go, ah, I'll go look at uh, Matthew Henry, or ah, I'll go look at the Expository Bible commentary, or ah, I'll go look at this one or that, or even John MacArthur, I'll go look and see what MacArthur says. And you get, you know, like over there in Romans chapter 9, Jacob, I love Esau, you know, well, let's see what they say about that. They don't say anything about it, typically. Okay. You know why? It's a difficult passage, that's why. Alright? If you go and you get online and you get a, into John Gill's commentary, and you'll find John Gill has something to say about it, because he has something to say in plenty about every single verse in the Bible. Hmm. He's an amazing uh, commentator. In any case, John Gill, old John Gill said this, all of the Christian life is a confession. It's a confession. Romans 10, 9, and 10. We're familiar with that, aren't we? You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you'll be saved. And here's the principle. There's the action. Here's the principle. For with the heart man believes, I like the translation, and is justified. Okay? That's what happened. When you and I came to Christ, we believed we were justified. Declared not guilty. Sin forgiven. That's justification. Okay? He believes and is justified. And then, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. All of salvation. Sanctification. We go on confessing our way all the way to heaven. Now what are we confessing? We're confessing not only Jesus is Lord, we're confessing, I have met the righteous requirements of the law. Praise His name. We're you know, I don't, we don't have time tonight, but if you go over to the beginning of chapter 6, even the very beginning, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound like the King James? God forbid that we should do that. I love that. Okay? And then this. By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Now that's not a statement like your mother makes when you come in with muddy shoes. How could you come in here with muddy shoes? I've told you 852 times not to come in here with muddy shoes. It's not that kind of a statement. It's just a statement of fact. How shall we, who have died to sin, live any longer in it? It's a hypothetical. We who have died to sin won't live any longer in sin. We may sin, but we're not living any longer in sin. Oh, guess what? I'm confessing on my way. I'm dead to sin. You say, well, that's pretty presumptuous. Really? Down at verse 11 of chapter 6, I don't have time. The apostle says, Consider yourself dead to sin. That's what our people need to be walking out on. Uh, 
on, on Sunday mornings. Yeah, on the times that they have to be brought up face to face with sin, and that we have to be brought up face to face with sin in our own personal life, we need to be brought up face to face to it. Okay? And we can see the shortcomings. You know, you don't read anything in here about behavior and conduct that's not a shortcoming. Okay? But what you read in here that's more glorious than all of it is that when God gazes upon me, He gazes first upon Jesus Christ. Amen. And He sees perfection in every respect. When I sin and it seems overwhelming, I write these things to you, little children, no man's sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Does it get any better than that? It gets no better than that. And that's what our folks need to leave on. Need to have that balance between, yeah, here's our, here's our experience, folks. And it's not pretty. Here's our Savior, folks. Beyond belief. Let's live here. And this stuff over here will start to change. Amen. We'll start to change. So I appeal to you, men and ladies. Okay. I appeal to you tonight for balance. I appeal to you that our position in Christ should get as much time as our experience in Christ even though we seem to spend a great deal of our time in our experience. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for these men, who will, many of whom will break the word to your children, to our brothers and sisters. We pray that when the time comes for conviction, that the conviction may be powerful and that people would repent, Christians would repent of their sin. But when the sin seems overwhelming, help us, Lord, to turn our attention and their attention to you, the powerful, precious Savior, in whom we reside, and in the person of the Holy Spirit who resides in us. And give us confidence that you will work in us, both to will and and to do your good pleasure and let us rejoice in every moment that we see that happening. We pray in Christ's name.